and welcome to my talk on Remote First. My name is Isabel Tristram. I'm open source strategist at Europese AG. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation and board member of the InnoSource Commons Foundation. Now a lot of the content of this talk and the ideas of this talk are based on things that I've observed at the Apache Software Foundation. And some of that is also based on things that I have learned in a talk back in 2008 given by Bertrand de la Cretas. If you're interested in digging deeper into the topic of asynchronous decision making, I would like to recommend you watch the, his video over on YouTube after my talk is over. Now for the dur duration of this talk, we will use an etherpad in order to bring some interactivity to it. I will show the URL again on each of the slides, just so you know, you can head over there right now already. Um, there are some questions that you will see during the talk. Um, however, you can fill them in whenever you like. Let's start with a little bit of inter interactivity. Think about your remote working experiences. What is the first sentence that you think of when hearing remote first? either during the pandemic right now already in open source projects or before um, everyone had to switch to remote. While you do that, I will go over the communication that we know already, that is office communication. Which types of communi communication do we have there? We have coffee machine chats where you have informal um, conversations going on, information flowing informally from team to team but also socializing and team building going on. We do have pairing sessions where a lot of um, knowledge and knowledge sharing happens, a lot of teaching happens. We have team communication at a desk where a lot of questions are being answered, a lot of teaching happens, but also a lot of coordination. We have te formal team communications like um, team stand-ups, like um, planning sessions, review sessions, we have cross-team meetings where architecture is being discussed, priorities are being um, checked. You have company all-hands meetings where there's typical one or two or three people sharing information with the entire um, company. But we also have lunch breaks. Again, very informal, used for socializing, but also for informal information flow within the organization. Now, moving to remote first, what we want to do is to transform all of these um, types of meetings, all of these types of communication over to a setting that works in a remote first company. In order to do that, we need to understand which, for which purposes we communicate. So I would like to invite you to start um, brainstorming on the question of which purposes for communication can you think of? Some of those I already mentioned. But also, which properties of communication settings can you think of? So, stuff like private versus transparent for everyone, but there are more properties. While you do that, again, the goal with remote first is to gain flexibility, both in terms of location and in terms of time. If you simply move office life over to our home, that won't make people very satisfied. What um, people expect moving to a remote first setting or what they should expect is that they gain some flexibility in terms of time. We still want to be able to transform in-office communication and all of them, not only for the formal stuff, to digital alternatives without increasing the time spent in meetings. You don't want to spend your day in back-to-back -back, um, video conf call sessions. The ultimate goal is to increase innovation speed through transparency, much like we've seen during the pandemic happened in research where researchers were sharing their learnings on preprint servers as soon as information was available so that other teams could build on that and move forward. As a first step, what we want to do is to transform in project communication, typically happening at a desk with people co-located. Typically, this amounts to a mass media where everyone needs to talk to everyone else in order to figure out what's going on. You have to go to Bob in order to understand how far he is with his speech. How does it work in open source? Well, we have central hub. We have one communication hub, 
where A, you have a place for unstructured brainstorming, discussions, etc. Typically, that would be a web forum or a mailing list or stuff like that, where people can communicate freely. And you have an issue tracker where you share, share progress, but also where you take technical decisions and where you can go back to in order to understand why a certain tech decision was made. Now, all of this conversation in open source is being archived, is searchable and is linkable. So it's available for future reference. So you have one central hub per project with people around it. Of course, you do not only have one project, you have multiple projects, so you have multiple of these hubs. So what happens if Project Kitten wants to learn something about Project Unicorn? You don't need all those synchronization meetings anymore. You can simply have one of your people or multiple of your people in your Project Kitten join communication channels of Project Unicorn and follow just in time conversations as they happen. Same way the other way around. So this way, if you do have dependencies between projects, it's fairly easy to follow what another project is up to, what they are planning, and to link into their conversations. What this also means is that it gets much easier for Project Kitten to be able to contribute to Project Unicorn because they already know what their roadmap looks like, they already know what they are working on, and they already know to some extent what the architecture looks like. Does this, is this suffi sufficient? Do we only need written channels? Of course not. There are some communication purposes where we need different communication channels. Think about resolving conflict, for instance. This is going to be very tedious in an issue tracker. For that, typically you would either meet in person if that's feasible, because it's much higher bandwidth. You see, um, see, see face of people, you hear their tone of voice, and you see what they are doing with their hands. If that's not possible, at least use a video chat where people can see each other, where jokes work, where humor works, where sarcasm and irony works. It doesn't work in writing so well. If that's not possible, because it's both fairly expensive to set up, because it's synchronous at least in time, if you think about video chat, then one option is to move to some online group chat. Um, you're sharing short messages in a fairly synchronous way. So if there is a misunderstanding, it's easy to spot and it's quick to fix. The only disadvantage of all of those channels is that they are not durable. They have to be repeated for every new conflict. And if you use those for information sharing, those sessions have to be repeated for every human who's new to the project. If you want something that's more durable, you can move to a medium that's lower bandwidth and that allows for asynchronous communication. That would be something like a web forum, a mailing list with a decent client and archive, or a tradition, traditional issue tracker. Is that sufficient for documentation purposes? Clearly not. For documentation purposes, you want something that is well structured, where it's easy to get a high level view of what's going on or of the architecture. For that, you will still need a web page or a wiki page. But what we can do if you have this baseline passive documentation already of conversations in your issue tracker or on your mailing list is that from your high level overview on your web page, you link into those previous um, discussions to pieces of information that have been explained in the past in a very nice way. So creating this high-level overview becomes much easier. So to summarize, you want one canonical place in order to keep current status, which is being provided as a self-service, so you don't have to go to Bob in order to ask them um, how far they are with their feature. You want to keep documentation and avoid repeating yourself. People will still ask questions, but you can point to your previous answers. And you want to be able to track previous decisions and provide your project with a long-term memory of why certain tech decisions were taken the way they were taken and which alternatives um, were ignored. Now let's go to step three, scaling decision-making through dis transparency. Or translated, how to make meetings with dozens of agenda items take an hour or less. The trick here is to make 
the meeting agenda available ahead of time for reading. And not only the bullet points of the agenda topics, but the entire protocol as it would be shared after the meeting. What this means is that everyone can read and follow the meeting before it really happens. What this also means is that everyone can add their pre-approval to items where they agree, such in such a way that those items are being moved out of the face-to-face -face time, leaving more time for r really important dis discussions that need face-to-face -face time. In order to be able to move um, more items out of the discussion space, you have to enable asynchronous communication in order to clear simple questions. That means that more people can pre-approve certain items because their questions um, were cleared ahead of time. You can use this commu communication channel, this asynchronous channel, even to prepare consensus. If you have um, multiple options on the table, um, the better you get at asynchronous communication, the more discussions and the more decisions you will be able to take asynchronously, moving them out of the meeting, leaving more time for more contentious discussions. So essentially what you're doing is you're not only opening up the software product, you're also opening up the entire creation process. What that means is that you need a lot of trust in your organization that learning is okay and that making mistakes is okay. Same thing currently in the pand pandemic. If you follow media on current research progress, you will see that learning and making mistakes in society is still something that we have to get used to. But we absolutely need that if you want to be able to move faster. Now, one step that I haven't covered in this talk and that I would like to invite you to brainstorm on the other pet is what about the informal conversations? What about the chit chat happening at the coffee machine? While it doesn't relate directly to your project, it's still important because it um, increases bonding between team members. Now, even in open source, we rely a lot on um, meetups and in conferences in order to see each other face to face and in order to find time to have some food together um, to establish friend friendships among projects. How do we convert that or how do we find alternatives that work at least to a certain degree um, in a remote first setting? Now one thing to keep in mind is that inner source is only one step in your journey. The goal is to train more humans in open source practices. What that means is that we are lowering the barrier to get involved upstream. What that means is that we will have more people um, getting involved with a project that they rely on on a day to day basis um, where they can help with moving those projects further, making it, making it possible for everyone in the ecosystem to move faster and to innovate faster. And for that, I'm happy to take questions.